And if you don't have it, I believe it's up on the screen. The Bible reads in Mark chapter 2, verse 1, And again he entered into Capernaum, speaking of Jesus, after some days. And it was noised abroad in the house that he was there. Verse 2, And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. So here's the scenario. Jesus is in the house, and there are so many people in the house that there is no more room for one single person. And outside, there's even multitudes and multitudes surrounding the house trying to hear the words of Jesus. And even to those that could not hear the words of Jesus outside the house, I'm sure that they were with their ear open saying, what is the master saying? And then the words would be reciprocated out and just spread abroad. That's the way that the word was spread in these days. Verse 3, they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy. He was paralyzed. The man could not walk. I don't know the reason. The Bible does not clearly state, but he could not walk. And the Bible says in verse 3 that he was born of four, meaning that he was carried by four men. Well, it doesn't necessarily say men, but I'm imagining it would require four strong individuals to get this person on top of a roof. As we see in verse 4, when they could not come nigh unto him because of the press, the people that were there, they uncovered the roof. So somehow they got up on top of the roof and began to uncover and pull off the tile. When they had broken it, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy was laid. So the picture in your mind is this man who could not walk. He's laying on what I would call a stretcher, some type of bed, and he had to be carried by four individuals, climb on top of a roof, pull off the tile, pull off the shingles, pull off the matter that was the roof, and somehow lower this man who's laying on a bed. You see the picture in your mind right now. Just imagine that for a moment. And when Jesus saw their faith, remember, he saw their faith, the faith of the four individuals. Not necessarily anything to state about the man who's paralyzed faith. I don't read anything here, but the four individuals had faith for the man who could not walk. And when Jesus saw those four individuals' faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, son, he first addressed him as his child. Not a stranger, not a guest, not even a visitor. Son, bringing identity, I am your father. Son, woo, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain other of the scribes and church people, Pharisees, that were sitting there. They were reasoning inside their hearts. The Bible does not say that they were speaking murmurs. It doesn't say that they were speaking blasphemies or speaking against what was happening. But they were murmuring and, and complaining, reasoning in their hearts. Why does this man speak blasphemies? In their hearts, they're thinking this. Who can forgive sins? but God only, and they're right, only God can forgive sins, and God was. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were reasoning within themselves, he said to them, why reason ye things in your heart? Notice Jesus went straight to the heart. Whether is it easier for me to say to the sick of the palsy, that his sins be forgiven? Or is it easier for me to say, arise, take up your bed and walk? They're conf he's confusing the church folk, the religious folk that only follow the law and they were, you know, against what the, he was bringing with the kingdom of God, the message he had. But he asked them a question, is it easier for me to forgive them of their sins or just is it easier for me just to tell them to get up and take his bed and walk? They're confounded in their mind because they're like, first of all, you can't forgive sins. You're just a man. Second of all, he can't walk. Now here's where the good part comes. <laughs> he says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Notice he states that first. Just so you can know that the Son of Man has power on this earth to forgive sin, since you all don't believe, watch this. 
He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Rise, take up your bed, and go thy way to thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and they all glorified God, saying to themselves and to everybody else, We never seen this on this fashion. Never have we seen anything like that. My goodness, even the religious folk that were trying to suppress the people and use religiosity for their own agenda had no authority or power to question this man named Jesus. So I want to stress on a few points before we sit down. There was four men that had faith for a man who could not walk. And Jesus did a miracle, not just to do a a magic trick or pull a bunny out of a hat it wasn't to impress the crowd it wasn't even just because he couldn't walk but so that you may know that the son of god has power on earth to forgive your sins i'm gonna do this just so you can know notice the emphasis of jesus's heart and, and compassion was not so much that you believe he can heal but I'm going to heal so you can believe more further so. There's a greater healing other than the healing of your body. There's a greater healing other than me just removing cancer, just removing tumors. There's a greater healing of the soul that needs to take place, and that is you coming to me as a son so I can forgive your sins. That's the kind of Jesus that we serve tonight. Let's put our Bibles down for a moment. Let's pray. Pray for me. Let's pray for each other. Let's ask God to have his way in this house tonight. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity and privilege to be in your house tonight. Lord, I thank you, God, for giving me your spirit, God, and allowing me to know you and to understand and to grow in your grace. I'm asking, God, that you would empower my lips, empower my mind, empower my whole entire mindset tonight. Eclipse me. Remove me out the way. Let us, God, hear a clear word from you tonight, and I pray these things to tonight in Jesus name can somebody say amen let's clap our hands to Jesus let's magnify the Lord one more time before we're seated because he's worthy to be praised hallelujah thank you for standing to the honor of the Word of God you may be seated praise God I want to title this message tonight bring them to Jesus bring them to Jesus you know as Christians once we come to church and once we understand God's grace and how he forgives our sin and how he forgives the the carnality and the evil and ugliness of our nature you know we bring that to God and a lot of times when we do that shame is always creeping behind us because the enemy who is the accuser of the brethren wants nothing more for us to look at our past If we can keep looking at our past, we're not really walking forward. Even if you're in the house of God, coming to church faithfully, always on time, early, and doing all those things that are known to be done good in the house of God, if you're looking back, it's always difficult to move forward, even if you're walking in the natural forward. You know, look at Lot's wife. Lot was was running with his family. Lot's wife was running away from Sodom and Gomorrah when fire brimstone was falling down. But her heart, and her heart was looking back, and that is whenever she turned into the pillar of salt. So there's concepts in God's words that teaches us that although we are pressing toward the mark, we must press with an internal desire and passion from the heart. And, and as we grow in God, we understand it's not just for our own personal salvation. It's not for our own personal experience in the house of God, being born again of the Spirit and having power over dominions and demons and having authority to cast out devils. That's just something that comes along with the package. It's like buying uh, a pair of shoes. And someone says the Holy Ghost is like buying a brand new pair of shoes. The tongues just come with them. It's a whole entire package whenever you get the Holy Ghost. All these things are in the package. And out of this experience is internal desire, not necessarily of ourselves, but the desire of the Holy Ghost that is reaching out for those who know not God and desiring to use you. Someone say me. You know, many times we don't understand or believe that God can truly use us. Many times, as Christians, we are called to be disciples of Christ. A disciple is a follower of Jesus who accepts the task and assists in the spreading of the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. 
This call requires us to share our faith with others. Now, Jesus' final words before he ascended were to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That's in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. It was also fulfilled in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, when Peter preached to the multitudes to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sin sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for this promise is not as unto you and unto your children and to them who are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call while this is clear many Christians today struggle with sharing faith for various reasons in fact recent studies show that only 2% of evangelical Christians actually evangelize with others think about that only 2% of evangelical Christians all across all denominations actually evangelize. Maybe one might say to themselves, well, I'm not smart enough. Has anybody ever said that? Maybe I'm not smart enough. I don't know enough. How do I do this? How do I share what's happening internally to external people and, and have this experience empower someone else's life how do i do that and then you end up just saying well i just can't do it maybe i'm not smart enough jesus's disciples weren't known for their brains or theology or degrees jesus's disciples were pretty ordinary guys you see in acts chapter 4 and verse 13 the bible says now when they saw the boldness of peter and john notice what did they see? The boldness of Peter and John. Where did they get this boldness to preach God's word with such zeal and fire? It was through the born-again experience of receiving the Holy Ghost. They already been speaking in tongues deep in the book of Acts right here already. And when they seen the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, you know, these guys are just zealous preaching, and, and, and they're preaching with such boldness, but the Bible says they're also understanding that these guys are unlearned. You know, they're just fishermen. They're just, you know, guys that work and do labor. They're the kind of guys I go to when I want to get some fish to feed my family. And now they're in a place of authority, speaking as oracles and mouthpieces from the Almighty God, and it's really working miracles, signs, and wonders. Blind eyes are open. Dead people are raising, and Jesus is gone. He already ascended. But the miracles of Jesus Christ continue to happen through the miraculous power and the works of the Holy Ghost. And whenever they seen that they're unlearned in this scripture, the Bible says that they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. My greatest prayer sometimes is, Lord Jesus, help me to have such a passion and zeal for the things of your kingdom and your heart. And help me manifest this desire and passion of your spirit to those out there who do not know you or had an experience. Or even if they have had an experience, how else can I empower them through the working of your spirit? Because whenever that happens, you don't even need to tell people that you go to church you don't even need to put a Jesus bumper sticker on the back of your car you don't even need to even wear a Jesus t-shirt I mean when you start getting into telling your testimony how many can ever say here that you were just telling your testimony one day maybe even sometimes many times for me I've had days where I've been down bad day at work traffic just making me want to just oh want to honk my horn and just maybe ride the tail of someone else am i the only one who thinks these things sometimes you know this, i'm driving to work this morning and i'm like oh goodness this person just you know if at least put the blinker on if you're gonna cut me off don't just swoop in i almost hit you i'm telling you whenever god wants to move through you 
He moves through just anybody who desires to be moved through. But we make it so difficult sometimes. I don't know a lot. I'm, I'm unlearned. I'm ignorant. But God has given you the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not afraid. It's not scared. It's not quiet. It, it works in wisdom. It works in compassion. But when it needs to be, it will be bold and it will be direct and it will impact. Many times whenever I have these crazy traffic days and I get get off and I don't have a cat but if I had a cat I'd probably kick it aside you know like get out of here Ugh. everything today went wrong and you go to the supermarket and I've, I've run across people that I've known from high school or people that I've went to school with and they haven't seen me for like 15 20 years right and they're like hey they call me Federico I, you know everyone here calls me brother Freddie but my name's Federico I have all these names they call me Fed they call me Rico I have like different people anyways Hey, Federico, what's going on? I'll be talking with them and just getting to see where they are in life. And once they ask me about me, I don't sit there and have to really have to preach to them. I'm just like, you know, I talk about my life and they already see the blessings. Oh, I got my wife. Well, there's my kids. Oh, yeah, I got this great job. Oh, yeah, I'm going to church. Oh, you're going to church now. I thought you were atheist. Well, I used to be, but check it out. And then boom, the open door just to share. But when, what, once I start sharing my testimony, I was discouraged. I was angry at the cars. I wanted to just run into the back of a truck in front of me. I didn't feel like I was the ultimate Christian. And all of a sudden, I'm like in the zone. Yeah. Well, check this out. It was just a few years ago, about maybe 15 years ago to be exact. This is what happened. And I start sharing this, and all of a sudden, something starts consuming me. Fire consumes me. I forget about what time it is. I forget that my wife is at the grocery line, already checked out, waiting for me with all these kids that are giving her a hard time. And she's watching four kids, and I'm over here at the checkout line like this. Spitting game, spitting game, telling testimony, telling testimony. And before I know it, I look at their eyes and flames. Man, I see it in the spirit, the excitement. They're like, wow, really? Well, where's this church at, man? What's going on? Hey, here's my number. Call me later. And I'm like, yes, I got you. I got you. Because the Holy Ghost desires to reach. And it, it's a fire. It wants to spread. It, it wants to be lit on a field. And it wants it to be a windy day. And it wants to consume everything in its path. And if that's not the Holy Ghost you got, I don't know what Holy Ghost you got. But that's the Holy Ghost that we ought to have for the lost. And I believe it is. That's why this church is just exploding. And I've never been a part of a ministry like this. Never. It's an honor to be a part of the ministry. As I continue in the scriptures, let me also just, since I touched on my testimony, the first thing that happened to me when I got the Holy Ghost was I won my mother to the Lord. My mom was the first person that I won to Jesus Christ. Let me tell you how that happened. My mom and I, we grew up Catholic. So did my dad. But when I was five years old, my um, mom and my dad, they divorced. So as I grew up as a child, I got bounced back and forth, you know, with dad on weekends. I lived with mom. You know, it was cool as a kid. I didn't have any brothers or sisters. So I just, you know, I remember growing up kind of angry sometimes, like, why can't I have a family? I remember I used to watch the Brady Bunch, you know, as a kid. I watched the Brady Bunch, and I'm like, man, you know, there's the dad, there's the mom, there's the sisters, there, there, there's even a maid, man. They got that family locked in. I used to always watch the Cosby show. I used to watch all the, uh, Full House. I used to watch Full House. Oh, man, Danny Tanner, when he starts talking to, like, DJ because she got in trouble at school, and they put that music on, and it touches your heart, and he's like, it's okay, honey. It's going to be all right. And you're like, oh. I used to watch those shows because I really wanted my family to be a family. But it was divided and broken. As I turned 15, I became anger. I needed a father. He wasn't there. He was there, but you know how it works. Just a lot of anger and fighting. And when I was 15, the first thing that happened was I went the opposite way. Got hooked on cocaine, uh, methamphetamines. You know, just, it, it progressed. It progressed. I became a young teenager, 18, 19. I started getting into witchcraft. At this point, I was already 
turned over, called myself an atheist. I didn't believe in God. I didn't experience God. The only church I've ever experienced was going to our Catholic church on Easter, Christmas, and uh, maybe when someone died or when someone got married. And every time I was there, you know, I just stood up and sat down, stood up, sat down, went home like, okay, that was just something to do. I didn't really get anything from it. And the more that I experienced these things during a crisis in my life of growing up and being tormented of devils, I became angry at God. I remember being alone and just thinking about how much my life was falling apart and I didn't want to live and I was hooked on drugs and I didn't care. I remember saying to God, even though I said there was no God, I, still, I would still talk to God. Isn't that interesting? Even the atheist somehow knows in his heart. I remember I used to be like, I hate you. Why would you do this? You don't exist. You're not real. I would say this to myself when I was alone. Matter of fact, I was probably one of those people that was driving crazy, talking to themselves in the car. I remember I got to a point where I was really, really going deep into witchcraft. I remember missing with black magic, you know, in a pitch dark room, staring into a mirror, playing these satanic rituals and doing chants. Like, I didn't know what I was really getting. Actually, I didn't know what I was getting into. I knew what I was doing. I just didn't know God. And the day came where I had gotten out of jail, and I was just 20 years old, about to be 21. And I was so fed up with my life, I wanted to commit suicide. I had a vision in my mind. I had the pistol. I was going to climb a mountain and shoot myself in the head. The only thing that would stop me would be the vision of my mother identifying my body. And when I would see my mother's face in my vision, I'd begin to cry. And I'd begin to just, just sit there hating life even more because I can't even do this. And all of a sudden, my friend called me. He wanted to, to get high with me. And he said, come, come and get high with me. And I thought to myself, well, maybe I'll do this one last time with Los Cardinales, with the homies. You know what I mean? I'll go, go get smoked out one last time before I do myself in. And he said, well, hey, it's Christmas Eve. I got to go to this church. I got to see my little sister. She's in a Christmas play. I'm not asking you to come to this Christmas play. I know how you believe. Just, just wait for me until it's over. I said, okay. He never showed up. He got pulled over and arrested. I show up. He's nowhere to be found. So I'm sitting here looking at all these church people walk into the church, just like tonight. Families holding hands, people dressed nice. I sat there and looked at this, and I was like, I hate this, man. This is fake. All these fake people, fake smiles, fake clothes, fake attitudes, fake God, all these fake people. I sat there and just angered, and I was like, where's my friend at? I'm done waiting. I went in there. I went in there with like this big old machismo boldness, you know, full of the devil, smoked out in marijuana. Walked in there, couldn't find him. One of these old sweet little grandmas was the, the usher of the church. She was like, oh, sweetie, how are you doing? And I walked in all hard. Oh, um, hi. She just totally broke that. I was trying to be hardcore. You know what I mean? I was trying to be thuggish, ruggish. And she's like, oh, mijito, come over here. Why don't you have a seat? I'm like, oh, no, I'm okay. I, I'm just looking for somebody. Oh, no, you need to come sit over here. And she pulled me to the front of the church on the front row. And I don't know why, but I followed her. I mean, I couldn't control it, brother. It was, like, uncontrollable. She had, my, she had me by the hand, too. So I was like, what am I going to do, yank my hand away from this old lady? She, she's like my grandma that I never had. Like, oh, my goodness, she's so sweet to me. She even kissed me on the cheek. I'm like, okay, well, take me over here, and maybe I'll just put up with this. And I sat down on the front row. And then all these kids came and sat next to me. And, and it turns out she put me in the row where all the children in the Sunday school sit. So I'm over here surrounded by kids, and they're like, hey, what are you doing here? I'm like, I, I don't know. I was, I was so embarrassed because I smelled like marijuana so strong, real strong, like everything about me reeked. And then kids are like, what's your name? And I'm like... My name's Freddy. And I, could, I couldn't be hardcore no more. I couldn't be thuggish no more. I, I was in this childlike mind. And then all of a sudden, there was this Christmas play, and there was this drama, and there was this entire scene where this broken family was there, and, you know, at the end, the answer was Jesus, you know, and the preacher comes out, hey, sinner friend, if you're here tonight, God has a word for you. You know, like all that stuff started going on, and I'm sitting here watching, 
And I started listening to this preacher, and this preacher was started to preach the word. And he said, the Bible says, and he said, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. He even started going deeper. There's a young man here tonight. This week you've been doing this, and you've been doing that, and you've been doing this, and you've been doing that. And no matter how much you do these things, you're still empty inside. Only God can fill that longing in your soul. And I sat there. And tears came down my face, and I was like shaking. I was like, what's wrong with me? Man, my palms were all sweaty. Palms were all sweaty, bro. I was looking at the exit door like, okay, how can I get out of here? You know, if I stand up right now and leave, it's kind of disrespectful. I, at least I had some respect for, for things like church. I was raised Catholic. They teach you this stuff. You don't get up during the sermon or when they're speaking. So I sat down like, hurry up, man. As soon as they ask us all to stand, I'm out. I sat there and waited. As soon as they said, let's all stand, I stood up, about to go, and the same old lady came over here. Oh, honey, why don't you come and pray? Praise the Lord. Okay, before you know it, I'm at the front of this church while I was trying to walk. My heart was walking towards the exit, but something was pulling me, and it wasn't just this usher woman. It was not just the greeter. Some, the, the Spirit of God was pulling me, and I could not control it. And I fell to the ground, and I did not know how to pray. I remember I put my face in the carpet, and I covered my face because I was crying, and I was embarrassed that people would see all the snot that was coming down my nose. I mean, I lifted up my face to get up, and all of this, this is one of those, you know when you're a little kid, and you're crying, and you got all that snot? I'm 21 years old, and I got this long snot, and it's, it's not breaking, and I'm on my hands and my knees like this, and I'm looking at the carpet, and no joke, I'll never forget this vision, or this, what I've seen. I've seen tears just dripping continuously from both eyes to the carpet, bang, 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 bang. Bang, bang. And I was like this. Oh, I don't want people to see me cry. I was thinking. And all this snot was going like this. And I was like. And then people started laying hands on me. And I, they were laying hands on my back. And I was like. They better get their hands off me before I turn around and choke them. Literally. That's what I had. I was angered. I wanted to choke them. What are you laying hands on me for? And all of a sudden. This preacher came up to me and grabbed his head. And goes like this to me. Bang. He slapped it on my forehead. Boom. He goes, son, you come in tonight and you have many devils. I'm going to pray with you and God is going to set you free. And I just, I just st I stood there like, it, I, when he did that, it paralyzed me. I had no control. I was like just paralyzed. He goes, I'm going to speak some words. And I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to these demons. Do you understand? And I said, yes. I knew something was going on because my leg was going like this on its own. I mean, I was like shaking. I wasn't trying to do this for show. I mean, something was happening to me on the floor. And then he goes, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I command you. And he started just quoting scriptures and quoting scriptures. And from the deepest part of my stomach, it was like, Bleh! I mean, like that happened. And I was like, oh, I couldn't control it. Then it became a scene where people surrounded me and I was on the floor just, oh! and, and, and it was a, an ugly experience but it was also a precious experience because God was fighting for my soul and I came to this place um, where I don't remember this but they said that I slithered on the carpet like a snake I remember uh, punching the ground a couple of times there was other things that happened I don't remember but people have stories they're crazy stories slithering like a snake you know what I mean but I do remember this I remember fighting to lift my hands and, and I knew that God was real because I was crying. He was pulling on my heart. I lifted my hands, and I wanted to pray, but I didn't know how. And, and I wanted to ask God to forgive me my sins, but I didn't know how. But the whole time, God was forgiving my sin. God was forgiving me. His first, the first thing that happened to me was just like the scripture. Son. He identified me as a son, and I acknowledged him as a father for the first time ever, and that made me cry. At the same time this was happening, demons were in me telling me, this is fake. This is not real. Get up. Get out. Go. This is fake. Look at you little sissy. You got your hands like this in the air. You little, you know, I was hearing these cur curse words in my head. Curse words in my head. You know, you little sissy. You're, you, you know, you're, you're gay. Just all these things because I have my hands like this, you know. You know, tough guys don't do that. And whenever, whenever I broke out of that, I said, Jesus, I need you. And when I said that, 
These demons that had me, ultimately, just, poof, they dropped me. My body fell on the ground flat like a pancake. I couldn't even lift my hands. I mean, I tried, and I was like, I, I accidentally slapped myself in the face. I mean, I was trying to. Nothing worked. I got up and couldn't even walk, and, and, and the demons left me. And the people were like, woo, yes. And then someone's like, yeah, woo. And I was like looking at these people, and I'm like, I don't know what I did, but I must have done something good because I came in bound, but God set me free. I came in demon possessed, but God set me free. I'm a believer. Jesus is real. And no demon has power over you when you call on the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. I said all that to say this. My mother was so fired up, angry, because I started going to church. It was like Thursday, getting all dry. I started, I got a tie. I never wore a tie in my life. I was so happy to change my image because I was so anti-Christ and gothic, wore satanic symbols on a daily basis. To get all that stuff, the first thing I did was I went home. Then I went through my bedroom and got everything that I owned. I probably even went above and beyond that I should. Everything that I owned, filled it up into seven big, large, hefty trash bags. Clothes, pictures, letters from old girlfriends, bad movies, you know what I'm talking about, magazines, music, every CD I possessed, every music I possessed, because the Holy Ghost first told me that the music I was listening to were was orchestrated by demonic spirits using these people as vessels to speak messages to me to control me. That was the first thing that nobody taught me this stuff. I was just like, okay, that's exactly how this is working. Tore off my posters on the wall of all the artists and music I was listening to. I built this big bonfire in this big barrel and started burning everything, burning everything, burning everything. And I had nothing left to go back to. And I said, well, God, this is it. I've given it all to you. My mother, she was tripping out. I mean, I was like on Thursday night, I got home from work, got dressed, had my Bible. She rips it out of my hand. She's like, what is this? And she opens it up and she goes, what's a concordance? Because you know the Bible says concordance in the very back. It tells you each scripture where you can find it and all that stuff. It's a study Bible. What's a concordance? I go, Mom, that's just a Bible. They gave it to me at the church. She's like, are you just playing games with God, Freddie? It, you're dressing like, like you're go, like going to church. What are you really up to? And I was like, Mom, I'm going to church. Like, I'm not even smoking weed no more. You should be happy. She's like, what drugs are you on now? I said, Mom, I'm not doing drugs. Honest. I said, I'm not doing drugs, Mom. I literally, I had this experience. I told her the whole experience. And she's like, get out of the house. And she was fired up and she was angry. I said, man, my mom got the devil too. <laughs> and I remember, I, I went to church that night. I got the Holy Ghost like a week later. Spoken in tongues, got the Holy Ghost. Oh, man, when, God got, when I got the Holy Ghost, I spoke in tongues. They had to drive me home. You know, I was one of those crazy meth addicts. If you're going to do something, you can go all the way. Get the Holy Ghost halfway. Man, I wanted to speak in tongues, man, until I couldn't do it no more. I, you know what I'm saying? All the way? Why half? All the way? Anyways, my mom comes to church. I'm on the front row right here. Man, they're singing songs, you know? You doing all this? When the Spirit of the Lord moves on my heart, I will dance like David danced. Those kind of songs I grew up to. When the Spirit of the Lord moves on my heart, I will dance like David danced. I will dance like David danced, like David danced, like David danced. I will dance like David danced, like David danced, like David danced. I mean, those, that's how I got the Holy Ghost. That song was playing. I was speaking in tongues. Man, whoo! I was so, I was, ah! I didn't care who saw me. I didn't care how stupid I looked. I do all of this, and I didn't care if my tie was falling off, or if I had, if, even if I had snot coming down my nose, I still didn't care. I mean, God set me free. I was so happy. And then I turned around in the back of the church with my mom, like this. She made this face like this. And I know my mom. This face I've seen it all my life. Whenever I do something bad, get in trouble at school. 
you know, like, like, like you're a bull and you're breathing. Like, the smoke. You know, the smoke nostrils. I look back and say, man, my mom's so mad. I probably look so stupid to her. I probably look unlearned. I probably look ignorant. I probably don't know any scriptures. I don't know how to tell her what happened to me. But all I know is I'm, I've been set free. And here she is looking at me. And then this preacher gets up and preaches this message about God washing all your sins away. God's mercy forgiven you of all your past, giving you a brand new start. It happens here at this altar altar tonight and my and at, at the end of the service whenever he called the altar call I stood at the front and I was praying I was like God I hope my mom is still here and then I looked over to my left at the altar on the other side <laughs> my mom was at the front of the church on the other side and she was on her knees very proud woman on her knees all these sisters were supporting her laying hands on her my mom was like this on her knees with her hands in the air and all her makeup was running down her face and she had tears coming down and I look real close I look real close and my mom was speaking in tongues she was there speaking in tongues speaking in tongues and I said oh my goodness this is more real than I thought if God can get a hold of my mom then what happened to me was not just some kind of fairy tale was not just some kind of crazy experience that happened to a young troubled man, but this was the authentic power that we read in scriptures through the working miracles of the Holy Ghost. God saved my mom. <laughs> Woo! And then that first year, that first year, once I realized that, I was on this rampage. The way you see internet marketers work and they kind of call your phone trying to collect bills and internet marketers that might be trying to sell you stuff. You ever seen those people on Facebook that are trying to sell you those, those rap things? Those, those raps, you know what I'm talking about. Those raps you put on your belly so that you can wake up the next day and be like, oh, that's a whole inch. You know, people, are like, people who are really into that kind of network marketing, they're sold out. I mean, you can't even talk with them without them wearing a button asking me how I lost 10 pounds. Hey, Josh, what's going on, man? How you doing? Oh, I'm doing good, bro. Yeah, how's the family? I'm doing my family's all right. You know what we were at last night? We were at this big old gathering where we're, you know, drinking these shakes to lose weight. And, you know, you should come check it out. You know, like the way those people get converted... We ought to get converted, inviting people to the house of God. My first year, I think I was more converted then, even than I am now. My biggest prayer is, God, help me to get more converted like I was before. My first year, Brother, Brother Danny Williams, 26 people of my immediate cousins, aunts, uncles, relatives, friends, 26 people in just one year through me consistently just keeping up on people to come to church and just really, really working and sharing my testimony. 26 were filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name because God desires to use you. It didn't matter how much that I knew. I didn't go to Bible college. Man, all I knew was that if God can save a sinner like me, then God can save anybody. And you don't need to have a testimony like me. You can be raised in church and have a greater testimony. Your testimony is God saved me and kept me from this world. God kept me from drugs. God kept me from addictions and other things and devices of this world. I was raised in church, but then God came to me in my midnight hour. God spoke a word into me and awakened my spirit, man. Now I'm an evangelist. Now I'm a pastor. Now I'm a preacher. Now I'm a teacher. This can happen to anybody. You don't have to be demon possessed. I'm talking about a real life testimony where God transforms you. I'm going to come to some more scriptures. I know they're probably going to bring the children in, but you got to hear some more scripture. I'm going to run through this more quicker. Matthew chapter 9 verse 6. Jesus says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power to forgive earth on, forgive sins on earth. I'm going to heal this man. It was through the passion and faith of four men that cared about another man who did, could not get to Jesus. You and I are symbolic. That is symbolic of the church today. There are people that can't get to Jesus because of circumstances. There are people that are so demon possessed that it takes somebody to be used by God. That vessel is you. That vessel is me. And we have to pray daily, consistently asking God, who is it around me that, that needs you and how can I through your spirit and with wisdom compel them and bring them to you? Because you notice there was nothing more that these four men did than bring this man to Jesus. They 
may overcome some obstacles that to carry him first of all, that to get to the roof second of all, and then get him to Jesus. Once Jesus seen the faith of the men, that's when the miracle happened. I'm telling you, Redeemer Apostolic Church, we have faith. God has seen the faith of this ministry. I've been praying. God gave me this word a week and a half ago. The ministry and the Sunday school department, especially those of you that were working for this children's organized uh, conference and the youth, you know, the, the, this, the, what was it called? Sorry? V vacation Bible school. I was praying, and God spoke to me about that. God says, I see that faith. When God sees that faith of this church as he has, it's then that we are going to see the things that we desire to see. And it's not just so that there can be noise abroad. He's doing miracles. Notice the main focus was that the sins of his child may be forgiven. That you and I would be in right standing with God is the ultimate miracle above all healings, above all, you know, let me be sick, but let me be washed. I'm telling you, if I can be washed, I believe God can heal my sickness. Hallelujah. In Luke chapter 18, verse 9 through 14, he spoke this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. As we close, this is how Jesus does not want us to be. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee and the other was a publican. Publicans were also referred to as like wine bibbers, drinkers, sinners, they curse like sailors. That was just a genre of people that's mentioned in Scripture. Verse 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. It's funny how the Scripture says he prayed thus with himself, meaning he wasn't really having no interaction or conversation with God. He was literally praying with himself. And this is what he was praying with himself. God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, um, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican right here. Now, I fast twice a week. I give my tithes and everything that I possess. And the publican standing afar off, he would not even lift up his, so his, much his eyes unto heaven, but he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. When I read the scriptures, there's two different things that I see. You know, I don't necessarily want to be just some kind of sinner, wine-bibber, speaks like a sailor, curse words everywhere. You look at my life, no reflection of the holiness of God, no reflection of God's majesty, just a straight ugly sinner living in sin. I don't want to be that. But then over here on this side over here, I don't want to be righteous in praying thus with my own self. God, I'm thankful that I give all my tithes, and I do all this, and I do all that, and I'm not like that man over there. When I pray and I see this, God's revelation to me is this. Our desire is not to be in one or both categories, but Jesus Christ stands in the middle. Grace stands in the middle. And although I'm not to live my life loosely and just sin and just live in adultery and fornication, I ought not to do those things. I ought not to boast upon my own righteousness and, and declare all my works before men that I may be seen of men. But I ought to stand right here in the grace of God, knowing that I am covered and forgiven of all my sin and God God has robed me in his righteousness, not of my own, and I am reflecting his majesty. When we walk in that power and we believe in who we are in Christ, in that revelation, it's then that we begin to shine. It's then that we begin to be the light of the world. It's then that a city that sits upon a hill cannot be hid. It's then that we are the salt of the earth. Hallelujah. Let's clap our hands to Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. And in closing, in John chapter 1, verse 38 through 42, you don't have to be special to evangelize. You really don't. 
you already are special in God's eyes. But we sometimes brand it like that guy's preaching behind the pulpit. He's got what it takes to witness, and I don't. We think that. You might even watch preachers on TV and say, wow, what a very good orator. What a very good speaker. And then they are. Oh, mightily gifted in, in speaking the word of God. Or, or you hear bishops speak, oh my goodness. You hear bishop preach and you try to compare that to yourself. You know, you, you, we do that and that's the error and that's our fault sometimes. We compare our gifts to another's gifts and if our gifts does not match that, we look at ourselves as if we're failing or as if we're not obtaining some level of standard to reach people when in reality God's just saying bring what you got because I'll use it John chapter 1 verse 38 Jesus looked around and saw them following Jesus says a question what do you want he asked them they replied rabbi which means teacher where are you staying Jesus said to them come and see he said it, and it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where Jesus was staying. And they remained with him the rest of the day. So Jesus called them over to where he was staying for the entire day. Verse 40 of John chapter 1. Verse 40 of John chapter 1. Get this. Andrew. When I say Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the disciples, we know those are familiar names. They're famous names. Peter, he got first Peter, second Peter. Peter walked with Jesus. John, the beloved of Christ, laid his head on the bosom of Jesus. These are really famous names. Andrew, majority of Christians today would be like, which one was Andrew? Was that the one that was like um, running towards that giant to cut off his head? No, that's David. I mean, Andrew, come on, everybody. Andrew, many people don't know. The Bible says Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John the Baptist said, and then Andrew followed Jesus. Verse 41. Andrew went to find his brother Simon, Simon Peter, and told him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And then Andrew brought Simon Peter to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Peter, the one who preached on the day of Pentecost, the plan of salvation, the one who had given the keys to the kingdom of he heaven, the one who unlocked it on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 plus received the baptism of the Holy Ghost? How did he ever hear about Jesus? Through Andrew. Andrew wasn't one of the, there's no book of Andrew. Hey, hey brother, you read, ever read 1st Andrew and 2nd Andrew? How about 3rd Andrew? Nah. Andrew wasn't mentioned much in the Bible, but he was the key to being the witness to Peter who introduced him to Jesus, who unlocked everything for all of us to come in and get this experience of the Holy Ghost. God desires to use you. Right now, let's all stand tonight. Hallelujah. As we stand tonight, before we leave, I know you have work tomorrow. I know you have things to do. Tonight, my wife and I, we have to get groceries with four crazy kids. That's not easy with the ages that they are. I got to work tomorrow too. Even though we have things on our agenda after church, even though we're busy in our daily life, this hour, God has given me this word a week and a half ago. And God told me that there are many in here that want to be used by God. And when you ask yourself, how is it God that I can be used? The voice of excuses overpowers the voice of God. And God has come tonight to remove the voice of excuses. God has come tonight, even in my life, I feel spiritually God doing this to me as I'm telling he, you he's doing this to you. God is wanting to remove my excuses. I was challenged a week and a half ago. Brother Carlos Miramon, we had a men's meeting, and if you're a man and you've not been to a men's meeting, I want to just encourage you, please, come to the next men's meeting. They're once a month. You don't need to be a scholar. 
You don't need to be, you know, licensed with the UPCI. Come. If you're a man, come to this men's meeting. And if you're a woman, go to the women's meeting. You get the emails. If you don't, subscribe to the mailing list. But in this men's meeting, he got up and said, God has given me a word. And it's about our life groups. God wants to work through our church on another level, and it's going to require those of us opening up our houses to people who need to know more, or just fellowship, just to talk about the things of God. You know, the average person doesn't have a Christian friend who has an experience, a real experience with the Holy Ghost. Honestly, most people don't. And when he began to just preach to us about his passion and desire that God's given him, God told me, why don't you open up your house? You know the first thing that happened, Brother Myers? I had an excuse. But, but God, I, I just moved to Mesa, and I don't even have furniture to sit them on. I have one couch, and it don't even hold my entire family. How am I going to have guests come to my house? God says, you organize it, and I'll set it up. And I sat there and said to myself, well, okay. I went to Carlos and I committed to a life group that I'm having this week. I don't know how it's going to happen. But you know what's really dumb about that? I can sit on the floor and still tell my testimony with the same passion I'm doing now. And when God spoke to me, it smote my spirit. God really, he just unveiled who I was before myself. And I sat there in agony saying, God, forgive me. Take me back to the heart of worship. Take me back to your desires that I once knew. I don't care, God, about my ability to preach your word or what I have done or, or that I've pastored and planted a church and I preached in India. Those things matter not, says God. God says I'm desiring to start brand new in every one of my children. And I want to use them in ways that they've never been used. We are to be servants of God, and in the process of working as servants for His kingdom, we start finding callings, and doors start opening, and before you know it, you're ministering in a nursing home where people in wheelchairs are getting the Holy Ghost. Some of you have had visions and dreams about being used in a nursing home. How many know that there's so many nursing homes and elderly homes in our community but they're neglected because it's not popular they're neglected because there's no desire they're the fatherless they're the widows they're looking for youth to come in and share their testimony and have an experience if you're in this house right now and God is speaking to you about being used I want to invite you to come up to these altars there's an anointing in this house that's falling down right now. Come underneath the anointing of God's calling and let Him activate that passion. Let Him activate that desire. I'm inviting you. If you don't come to the altar much, just step out of your box and come. God is awakening the spirit man within you. God is awakening and quickening your passions tonight. And you don't need to wait for the song to start. You don't need to wait for someone to lay hands on you. You can just lift your hands right there. And you can just lift your voice right there. Just cry out to God. Yeah. Oh, let's lift our voices, church. Let's lift our voices as well. Let's lift our hearts with our voices to God. Just a glimpse of yes. your glory, yeah. For just a minute, I ask for I'd give my all. It wouldn't matter the price I'd have to pay. The time might have to wait. Lord, I hunger for you, for your presence, for your fragrance, for your power. I hunger that earth. I hunger. 